Um, thanks, um, Mayor Pro Tem McGeary, and I want to thank all of the participants and our city staff that are here this morning. Um, this is an incredibly important um, forum and discuss really important issues. Uh, we've been lucky enough at the City of Imperial Beach and our Mayor's Task Force on COVID-19, which is, was assembled with our City Council, City staff, and our residents uh, and professional stakeholders to really address this humanitarian and economic crisis with a uh, high-risk population subcommittee, one related to business and workforce issues, one related to how the city um, itself prepares, um, how we deal with um, uh, public health and then public safety. And obviously, uh, under, this, under this subcommittee of, of uh, high-risk populations, it's really clear that we need to make sure we reach every resident of Imperial Beach uh, and the region, and more importantly, help people provide, get people information they need to help themselves and their families. So that's the commitment in Imperial Beach. As a first generation American and a uh, proud parent of immigrant parents who came to this country, I'm painfully aware, we're, and actually my childhood watching my mom get her citizenship, um, how, how much time is needed to spend with your immigrant family on getting paperwork. In Spanish, it's called tramites, uh, tramitando, right? And so um, that's why this, this uh, workshop is so important to make sure everyone has access to the resources they need because we're committed to every resident in Imperial Beach and every family and every neighborhood. So with that, I want to thank Paloma, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Pratema Geary, um, all the participants for sharing your knowledge on this Saturday morning, um, and then our city staff and all of you who are calling in. And don't say to stay. And then what we're going to say is uh, this, we're going through tough times, but if we work together collectively, we will get through this. And having all of us work together as a strong team committed to every resident is how we're going to do that. So uh, thank you for having spent your time uh, committed to this. And uh, we look forward to helping you guys far into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you for being here. So I also um, um, I want to, um, again, thank our panelists for being here this morning. We have a very um, a distinguished number of uh, folks who have, were able to join us today. Um, Nancy Sasaki, who is the president and CEO of United Way San Diego. She will be sharing um, with us information on the San Diego Worker Assistance Initiative and their free tax prep program. She will then be followed by Erin Surumoto Grassi from Alliance San Diego, who will uh, share with us information about the San Diego Immigration Rights Consortium Immigrant Relief Fund and how to access that financial assistance. And then lastly, we will be joined, um, Jose Alvarez will share some information. He is the district representative for Senator uh, Ben Hueso, and he will share with us an update on uh, Governor Smith's recent efforts to provide assistance to immigrants in our state. So uh, at the very end, we'll allow some time for Q&A. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy. Thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you. Uh, can everybody see that as I go through my slides? Um, so thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be able to tell you more about what we're doing. Um, and now my slides don't advance. There they go. Um, definitely, as y'all all know, um, our world has certainly changed and it changed really quickly. Um, on March the 9th was when we had our first reported positive case of COVID-19. On March the 13th, the schools announced that they would be closing on the following Monday. On March the 16th, where this picture is from, we announced a partnership for the COVID-19 Community Response Fund on behalf of Senator uh, Council Supervisor, come on, Nancy, uh, Supervisor Nathan Fletcher in the County of San Diego, as well as SDG&E, the San Diego Foundation, United Way, and the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. That's when we announced those funds. Um, in March, on March the 19th, stay-at-home orders were released. So from March the 9th, when the first case was found in San Diego County, to March 19th, 10 days, all of that happened. Um, it has taken us quite some time to put together the Workers' Assistance Initiative, but I am really proud to say we did finally get that stood up. Um, and what the Worker Assistance Initiative does is that it is for low-wage workers who have lost their job or had a reduction in hours as a result of COVID-19. Um, we are able to pay for utilities, including gas, electric, water, 
um, internet, as well as rent and mortgage payments. And our aim is to complement the work of the public health uh, officials and to prevent the need for anybody to have to enter the social services system of care, as well as trying to prevent homelessness. What's been really fascinating about all of this is that it has just, it has just taken off and it is crazy how uh, many applications we received in about two weeks period of time. We had over 8,400 individuals and families had applied requesting emergency assistance for their utilities and or their rent and mortgage. And that came in valued at over $2.3 million. So as you can imagine, the um, demand has certainly outpaced um, the amount of supply that we have. The Worker Assistance Initiative, although in partnership with the San Diego Foundation's COVID-19 Response Fund, is a separate fund. We've received about um, just under $2 million to distribute um, to the community. So as you can see, that's a big gap. So we are still fundraising and looking for funds there. We have also stopped accepting applications for us to be able to process the 8,400 that have come in. And as soon as we do more fundraising, we'll continue to release that. And I can tell you that the community is incredibly generous and we are still getting money in the door. So even those that have um, applied will probably still get something. Um, what's been interesting is that so, so much of the money has been coming in for food distribution and going to other organizations. So when you look at rent and mortgage as well as the utilities, a lot of people are saying, well, you can't get kicked out of your house and you can't get your utilities turned off. So maybe we don't need to focus on that. But the truth of the matter is that when all of this is said and done, um, people will still owe those bills and they may still be unemployed and those bills will still be due. So we believe that by providing support in this area, we're actually helping people's mental health and reducing their stress because these bills are getting paid. So we're very excited to have this available. Um, these are the places that you can go, uh, uwsd.org to donate, slash donate, slash COVID-19. Or there's also, you can give back if you have time on your hands, there's different ways that you can volunteer. And on our website, you can go to volunteer.uwsd.org slash COVID-19 and find places to volunteer. You can do all kinds of things. You can drive um, people, and you can go pick up their groceries and bring them to them. You can participate in a food distribution drive. There was one this morning at the SDCCU Stadium, um, working with the Labor Council as well as Feeding San Diego. The San Diego Food Bank is also doing food drives around the county as well, so you can help them out. As you can see, you're wearing gloves, you wear the mask, and the car drives up, they pop the trunk, you put the stuff in their trunk, and you don't touch anybody um, or, or, or see anybody really, um, except for the trunk of their cars. Um, with this particular drive was 1,100 cars, and that, that same number came through this morning. Um, it's very heartbreaking because as you're finishing up your volunteer duties and you walk away, you see that there are cars that were in line that get turned away. And this is happening every single weekend. This is happening throughout the county, um, that people are coming in to pick up food, so the need is great. And the third picture is you know, there's also ways to do it virtually. Um, some of the senior centers, um, especially like Elder Help, are asking for volunteers to come in and help out and you just call a senior just check in on them and make sure they're doing okay and that they don't need anything um, and they do trainings every Wednesday so there's different ways to give back that way there's also another way that most people don't really know about um, and that's the free tax prep that we um, that we run it's the earned income tax credit that's available to people um, the, the IRS estimates that there's around 300,000 families in San Diego who would qualify for tax refunds that aren't filing for this uh, much needed relief. Um, so um, we do it to improve and impact family stability. The um, United Way led Earned Income Tax Credit Coalition is anchored by a partnership with the County of San Diego and the IRS. They help put the money in. Um, last year, when we were doing these taxes, we had 20 partner organizations. We had 65 sites around the county, 650 volunteer tax pre preparers also. And in that effort, we were able to bring back over $47 million in federal and state refunds, and about 15 million of that was in EITC credits for 33,000 households. That can sometimes average close to $2,000. So if people haven't been filing, if they're income eligible, that would be around $56,000 or less that they made in um, this past year. 
they would be they would potentially be eligible and you don't have to pay for the tax preparation they have qualified and trained volunteers that are doing this for them and it's like done right then they're doing a lot of this online now because of the requirements to stay at home, but you can call 211 to make an appointment and find out where to go to uh, where to call to get your taxes done and to see if you are eligible for the EITC credit. And that's um, all I have. Um, we are 100 years strong. This is our centennial year in San Diego County, and we've been here always to help support the needs of the community, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. We'll, we'll hold off questions to the end. So then um, I'd like to pass it over to Aaron, if you will. Thank you so much. Very much, Deputy Mayor, and thank you for the incredible leadership of Imperial Beach. I think what you're doing to make certain that resources are available to the community is really important. And I haven't seen this sort of leadership necessarily um, in other places. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on the call. Um, so my name is Erin Sermodograi. I work for an organization called Alliance San Diego, and our main goal is to make certain that everyone in San Diego has the opportunity to achieve their full potential in an environment of safety, equity, harmony, and justice. Um, so we do that many different ways. One of the ways we do that is by uh, helping build coalitions and working in coalitions. And so one of the coalitions that we actually coordinate uh, from Alliance San Diego is the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium. It's a coalition of over member organizations across San Diego County um, that work uh, basically to advance the rights of immigrants and refugees. The organizations come from many different backgrounds, so from faith, uh, legal, labor, and community backgrounds um, work together to advance that a common agenda that helps refugees and immigrants. Uh, so one of the things that we noticed uh, in the light of the current crisis was that there was a need to help um, immigrant workers. Um, so we realized very quickly on that uh, while there was food assistance, people could still go to food bank, um, they could still access other services. There was a real need for people to be able to have um, money to be able to, to pay for things that they might not be able to get assistance for. Um, so for example, you know, if you wanted to get gas, going to a food bank is not necessarily going to help you with gas. Um, if you need to make a car payment, um, which for a lot of our immigrant workers who are working as, um, you know, farm workers or um, perhaps as handymen or domestic workers, the ability to have a car is critical, right? So things like this, um, there wasn't really funding available for our most workers uh, because a lot of them are ineligible for government assistance and the other types of benefits out there um, didn't, didn't meet that need. So the coalition decided to, we wanted to try to help fill some of the, the gap there by creating a fund for immigrant workers. Um, so we founded the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium, SDIRC, Immigrant Relief Fund, um, to be able to do that. And what the fund does is it provides a one-time grant to an individual um, of dollars. Um, so it's open to immigrant workers. Um, so basically, you have to have been born inside of the United States. Um, and it's giving priority to individuals who cannot um, apply for other benefits. Um, so for example, individuals who are unable to apply for things like food stamps or unemployment, um, the folks we're trying to prioritize because we know they don't have access to other benefits that could help them. Um, and then also, also giving priority to um, households that have not received a grant already, as well as to households of two or more, because we know there's a lot of families out there who are in need. Um, so the response has been sort of um, overwhelming and incredible at the same time. We, similar to the United Way, we did see a number of donations come in and foundations um, line up to help because they recognize the need. Um, and then we also received a very large number of applicants. So as of Friday, we've had received over 5,000 applicants. And very similar to what Nancy was mentioning is the stories have been just heartbreaking. Um, so some folks are listing the reasons why they're applying and, and we're seeing very similarly, not, not to pay for food, but to be able to pay for rent or a car payment. You know, our folks, um, and our communities are realizing that while they may not get kicked out of their home if they can't pay for rent, 
in three months, they're going to have to still be able to pay that. And so our folks are really worried. Um, but so far we've been able to help 130 people and we continue to do so. Um, and we'll continue to review them weekly and, and provide funds as, as funding becomes available. So that's a little bit about the Immigrant Relief Fund. I believe um, the Deputy Mayor also wanted me to touch very briefly on a couple of other things um, regarding healthcare and public charge. Um, so one of the biggest questions that we are getting regarding the fund is whether or not this will um, have negative consequences for folks under the new public charge rule. Um, and the answer is no, it will not. There are very specific um, programs that are listed under the public charge test that they're looking at. Um, their cash assistance is on there, but it's from local, state, or federal government agencies. And this is not from a local, state, or federal agency. Uh, so it would not fall under that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important for folks to note um, who are part of immigrant families or who are working with the immigrant community is that USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, has stated that folks, um, there will not be a negative impact on folks when it comes to um, being able to get COVID-19 testing, treatment, or preventative care. Um, so that's not going to negatively impact someone's immigration status um, or impact public charge. So folks should not be afraid to go seek out care if they need it. That's something that we really wanna message out. Um, and the other thing is that there are services available. I know the governor um, is trying to make testing as available as possible and is even looking at uh, making certain that community clinics have that testing and, and um, treatment available. So there are resources available for folks um, if they are undocumented and they should be able to access that without fear. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll pass it over then to Jose, who will share with us an update on um, what Governor, Governor Newsom has been working on. Thank you, Councilmember Arrive. Um, uh, yes, so um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you want me to do this in English or in Spanish. Um, I don't know what's better for our purpose. Paloma. She's muted. Okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. No, um, I think if we, we, can, we can continue in English, it's fine. Okay. Um, so th this Wednesday, uh, Governor Newsom made a very big announcement uh, regarding um, aid for undocumented immigrants in the state of California. So uh, the state of California has uh, began a public-private partnership with the philanthropic community in our state. Um, the state is uh, appropriating $75 million for a, a fund where undocumented immigrants will be able to apply and receive a one-time $500 cash payment. Um, this uh, benefit is capped at $1,000 per household. So only two adults per household can receive this payment. Um, and applications, so this program is, you know, was just announced this week. Uh, the state is in the process of uh, setting up a website and a whole uh, application process. The applications uh, will be available beginning next month. And, uh, you know, that's all the information we have at the moment. But I encourage everyone to please reach out to our office. Uh, our phone number is 619-409-7690. Reach out to Senator Weso's office um, and uh, we'll be able to guide you on where you can apply and, and everything you will need. And as far as, uh, you know, any dealings that I know that Erin just uh, touched on public charge rule, I just want to remind everyone that uh, anyone accessing uh, you know, government assistance programs from the state of California will not, uh, you know, will not be negatively affected under the public charge rule. Anything related to healthcare, uh, preventative healthcare, anything related to healthcare uh, with, regarding the coronavirus will not affect you. So we encourage people to um, get out there and get that help uh, uh, and, and not be worried about that. Uh, that is that is pretty much everything for me. Um, just, just again, it's, it's pretty big news. It's very, very unprecedented. Uh, it stirred up uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people across the country were uh, not happy with Governor Newsom uh, with this new program, but, but we're very excited that we're going to be able to finally help and document uh, workers here in California.
Thank you, Jose. Thank you for that update. And Reina, if you can uh, um, um, unmute all three of our panelists. Um, uh, I just want to reiterate my gratitude for all the work that you are doing and helping the hundreds of thousands of, of folks suffering right now. I mean, we're all suffering, but especially the immigrant community because they are doing the, the essential work that is keeping us going, right? They're the ones, uh, you know, harvesting our food. They're the ones cleaning our facilities. And, and to not, uh, you know, have assistance for them is just, um, you know, would be heartbreaking. So the work that you're doing is incredibly important. I wanna um, throw out there kind of like a rhetorical question just so that we can maybe contextualize what are the consequences of not providing assistance to the immigrant community, whether they're undocumented or documented. Who can, who can uh, take a shot at that? What are the consequences? What, what would you say to someone who would state, well, why are you helping them and not me, for example? I can, I'll I take, can answer. I can. Go ahead, Jose. Well, well um, just really quick, I would say that uh, not helping our immigrant community is uh, not helping yourself. These people are uh, essential, essential workers, obviously, but they're essential parts of our communities. They're uh, pillars that they keep this country going. And um, I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot, not taking care of the people that take care of us. Great. True. Very true. Nancy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I did. I, you know, that's been a question that we've really um, struggled with sometimes because at first when we launched our worker assistance initiative, there was, everybody was unemployed, right? There were a lot of people who didn't know whether or not they would have access to any benefits. There were people that were left out. And as we've gone through this crisis, people, the federal government has stepped up in terms of adding the, the stimulus check, in terms of adding $600 on top of unemployment insurance. They expanded the definition of who can apply for unemployment insurance. Gig workers and self-employed used to be outside of unemployment insurance. So more and more people started to get more benefits, right? Some access to some funds that could help them out. So we kept looking at, well, who's, keep, who's still left out? Who's still left out? Who's still left out? And so many times those populations are the ones that are these essential workers that aren't filing taxes or they do file a tax and but they're under the I-10 number and so they aren't eligible. They're, you know, we're finding out that if you're claimed under your parents tax um, uh, filings, then you're not eligible. Even if you're a college student who is working on campus, now you're not eligible and they don't get the $500 child bonus because you're over 18. The disabled are many times claimed under their parents. So you keep getting down to these um, communities that are always left out. And that's why I think it's important and really, you know, we ought to be applauding what the governor did to help out the immigrant communities in the undocumented communities. Absolutely. I think the other thing that I would add too, on top of that, I think those are excellent points that both um, Jose and Nancy raised. Um, but the other thing I would add is that there are a lot of children, U.S. born children, um, parents who are undocumented who are going to be impacted. And so not just children, right? There are a lot of mixed families in our region. Um, California overall has a immigrant population that's 27%. Now everyone is undocumented, but um, that's still a significant group of folks um, who are impacted. I think the statistics are there one in, I went out of about 50% of all children in the state of California have an immigrant parent. Um, so the impact on children and on families, if we don't do this, is going to be disastrous. Absolutely. Um, let's go to Rick. I think he has a question. Hi. No, um, I, I, these are all really wonderful points. Uh, there was an interesting poll that I just saw that came out, I think yesterday. It was a poll conducted by Latino Decisions uh, that surveyed 1,200 Latinos between April 7th to April 12th, uh, basically saying that uh, nearly two thirds of Hispanics have lost their jobs or suffered a significant reduction in their incomes as, as a result of this. And if we think about, I mean, that's, that's a lot of, that's a, that's a huge disproportionate number of people within a certain uh, category. What kinds of jobs are those? What kinds of jobs are those? And I think that's, yeah, that's I think something for us to think about. They're, they're gonna be essential jobs, jobs in, in the food industry, where we get our food, uh, how we get food delivered to us, or how we get food prepared to be, where we can go and access it and pick it up for our families. And it's, it's, just, it's just one thing, but it's just a disproportionate number of people in, in those, those racial minorities that are the hardest hit economically. Um, and they take care of us in such huge, meaningful ways, so. Absolutely. If it's helpful, I can answer oh, some I can of the answer. 
the pieces that um, Rick was mentioning, like which jobs are we seeing? So the folks that we are having applying, um, we have had folks who work in hotels, we've had restaurant folks who work in restaurants, um, domestic workers, so individuals who are cleaning houses, um, landscapers, gardeners, farm workers, um, folks who work in dry cleaning. Those are just some of the ones that come off the top of my head that um, we've had apply. Yeah, we've, we've had those similar categories as well as salons, people who work in the salons, people who are driving for Uber, um, you know, all, all kinds of uh, positions. I think, it, I think what we have found is that it really does go across all industries. It is just, it, it is everywhere. Everybody has lost jobs. What was really interesting to me the other day, I heard Peter Kallstrom talking from Workforce Partnership and he said they have jobs. So I don't know what jobs they are. I don't know what the qualifications are. I know that many times they're looking at jobs that are paying at least the living wage. So I would encourage people to check out what they might have listed on their website. I have not looked, but I did hear him saying they had jobs. Anybody? So I may add a, may, may oh, I, may I, I had a, it's kind of a separate point, but it re, re, it's regarding uh, immigration and legal immigration, actually. Um, I forgot to say this earlier, but uh, a lot of legal immigrants, a lot of people with green cards or, uh, you know, with legal status in this country are, uh, you know, they're hesitant to access unemployment insurance benefits in the state of California, you know, based on the public charge uh, rule. Um, if you receive any type of state assistance related to COVID-19 uh, specifically, and you know you can have proper documentation that you were laid off as a result of the coronavirus, um, you can access these. Uh, you can access the, the state insurance benefits, and um, you know the federal government will take that into account. They will see the documentation, and they won't. Um, you know they won't charge you negatively because you access these funds. Uh, you know, during this time. And this was specifically said, uh, this is on the website, um, USICS, give me a second. Yeah, USCIS, US Citizen and Immigration Services. It's, uh, um, you know, they have updated uh, information regarding the public charge rule. So people can go to their website and, and read everything. But um, just as a quick recap, you are free to use uh, State of California benefits, unemployment insurance benefits, uh, if you were laid off uh, because of coronavirus. I think um, something else that's really important to note is that public charge is a determination that's made when someone is adjusting their status. So generally speaking, most individuals who have green cards, um, and it's a question that still comes up. Um, we do get it from green card holders. We get it from refugees. We hear multiple folks talking about this who would not be impacted by public charge um, because there hasn't been a lot of information out there and it's been sort of confusing. Um, but if someone has a green card, they should not be worried as worried about accessing resources, right? Because that determination is generally made when folks are adjusting status to actually get um, legal permanent residency. But if folks have questions about public charge, um, they can, one of the, a really good website to go to is protectingimmigrantfamilies.org. Um, it's a nation, nationwide coalition that is working on issues around public charge. And they have lots of resources about exactly who's impacted by public charge. Um, if you have other questions, there are a number of legal service providers in the, you know, in the county who are able to help answer some of those questions as well. Thank you for sharing that. And um, we'll work on getting some of these resources available in both English and Spanish on our social media and website um, for people to access. Um, I believe there was a comment or another question, Edrena? Yeah, so Juan uh, wrote, unfortunately, the jobs that immigrants perform are the jobs that nobody wants to perform. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I, if anybody doesn't have another question, I have just some, a couple of um, questions regarding the, um, uh, I think this one was for Nancy, but I guess it also applies for the uh, Immigrant Relief Fund. What are some of the, re the requirements to qualify for assistance in, in, um, when they apply to the uh, worker um, initiative? Yeah, so the worker assistance initiative had two basic um, requirements, and one was that you lost your job um, as of March 1st or after. So the timing was important to us. The other was that um, you make less than twenty-two twenty-five an hour, which is based on some uh, data that the United Ways of California has done that we call the real cost measure. 
So instead of looking at what living wage is and what um, federal poverty limits were, we wanted to look at what is the real cost to live in our community. And that's how we determined 2225. Okay, thank you. And then um, I know you may have mentioned it and I may have missed it, but you said how much can up to how much would they be able, eligible to receive? We put caps based on the number of people in a family. So single person, the cap was 1300. Mm -hmm. um, I think two people or maybe an adult and two children, something like that was 2100. And then the top cap was 3000. And I have to tell you all, SDG&E has just been an incredible funding partner with us. They've been really uh, putting in the most of the money that we have in our fund so far. And one part of those dollars are just for gas and electric bills, but another part of those dollars they put out there to pay other utility bills as well. So they've gone beyond their, their, their charge in terms of service to the public, and they've definitely been a really strong partner with us. Great, thank you. Yeah, as well, and um, they were one of the first utility companies to uh, put a moratorium on utility bills, and you know they've been very supportive of our efforts here in Imperial Beach as well. So we're very grateful to them too. Um, anybody else have any additional questions? Hi, yes. I, I I do have an additional question. Um, th so so the 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 initiative or the order that Gavin Newsom um, revealed on Wednesday, the public private partnership, is that? Does that have a name yet? I, I've been trying to see if it's called something. And the website that's going to be put up, is that going to be a state-run website or are or, or individual like NPOs like like Alliance or something like that? Are they going to be monitoring these websites? How does that how is that going to work? So uh, Rick, at the moment, we don't know. Uh, actually, what, what I told you is, is everything uh, we know as far as okay. uh, the state. Um, we we do expect that it will be through grants through uh cbos and, and nonprofits, but uh you know no more uh no more information or, or nothing uh concrete at the moment but that's why i invite everyone to you know keep uh you know give us a call next month you know the first week of next month uh and we should have more uh information on that we can guide people to where they need to go and i got just one last question um the, the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, is this, I, I feel like I've, I should know this, but for some reason I just don't. Is this available primarily to low income families? Is there like a threshold or how does yeah. this? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what the, the threshold is for this year. It's somewhere around fifty six, fifty seven thousand dollars $57,000 annually okay. or less. Um, one of the things that the California Earned Income Tax Credit did was they actually expanded um, of, um, eligibility to seniors this year so it's even more so there's more people that are eligible for the Cal EITC and then there's other requirements for the federal EITC and then there's free assistance for this for these uh, uh, for these uh, uh, individuals or families through 211 yeah so call, call 211 to make okay. the appointment we have 20 partner organizations running okay. sites all over the county so if they can get one that's close to them okay. most of it's being done online now because of the stay-at-home um, okay, requirements Okay, yeah, that's so, good to know. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. You bet. One other thing I did want to say about SDG&E, you might start hearing that the funds haven't gone out. Um, we did start processing dollars. They are going out the door. In our partnership with SDG&E, we have to send them the verified and eligible bills, and then they process them to verify that, in fact, those bills are due. And they're saying it could take them as much as long as a month or longer to process all of that. We're hoping to get them a little bit faster, but some people may start getting panicked because they've applied and they haven't gotten funding. But um, if to the degree that you can help, help people um, just stay tight on that, it would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, um, anybody else have any questions? I see Claudia online. Hey, Claudia. Well, I have, um, can we talk a little bit about, oh, there she is. Hi, Claudia. Hello, I'm sorry, I didn't find the, the mute. Thank oh, you. Fine. Thank you, everyone. I just want to uh, gather some information so we can uh, share it in our webpage. Thanks for all the, all the work that you're doing. 
And Cla Claudia is uh, one of the key uh, coordinators of Tijuana Innovadora. So she uh, does some tremendously important work, uh, cross-border work to uh, promote cooperation and collaboration. And she's also a resident here in Pearl Beach. So thank you for joining us, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, Paloma. Hello um, to everyone. <laughs> Okay, so um, can we can we uh, talk a little bit about just in case there's folks out there that may not be familiar with some of these terms like ITIN and things like that? Can we just spell it out very clearly? Like, what does it mean to have an ITIN, and who can file or who files taxes, or who is eligible to file taxes, and then who are eligible to uh, receive some of these funds at the state level, at least, if not at the federal level. Can we just kind of like spell it out in simplest terms for folks that may not be familiar with some of these terms that we're discussing? Right, so Paloma, I'm gonna answer that real, really fast. Um, basically, if you are legally allowed to work in the United States, um, I encourage you to go to the edd.ca.gov. That's the California Department of uh, um, Employment Development. And uh, there you'll be able to apply for uh, an insurance, uh, I mean, uh, unemployment insurance, if you were laid off because of coronavirus, or if you or your family um, was affected by the coronavirus, you could apply for disability insurance. Um, and, I, and I remind everyone that uh, from now until July 31st, uh, if you do apply for an unemployment benefits, you will receive $600 additional dollars uh, from the federal government as part of the CARES Act. So there's a lot of help right now and I encourage people to you know make calls uh, research what's out there give my office a call 619-409-7690 um, and we'll be able to guide you uh, you know as far as we can hi Paloma so um, an ITIN number is an individual tax ID number it's a number that individuals who do not have a social security number use to file taxes um, so what a lot of folks don't realize is that there are a number of undocumented workers who are filing taxes using an ITIN number. Um, unfortunately, if you have an ITIN number, it's just to do that, it's, it's to file taxes. So you're not getting anything back from it. Um, you're not eligible for the earned income tax credit, both at the federal level or at the state level. You're not eligible for um, unemployment or food stamps. It's just to be able to file taxes. And what a lot of people are probably surprised about is that folks who have ITIN numbers are filing taxes because they believe that they are part of this community and they want to contribute. Um, so one of the things that um, a number of organizations have pushed for, I, so I know one of the pushes at the federal level was for ITIN holders um, to be able to get uh, some of the benefits coming back because they are filing taxes. Um, one of the long pushes, long-term pushes that the California Immigrant Policy Center and other statewide partners have pushed for um, has been for the state of California to expand the California Earned Income Tax Credit to allow ITIN um, tax filers to be able to get uh, credit back as well. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. A lot of uh, folks don't realize that many uh, folks who don't have Social Security are filing those taxes and contributing back to society and the, and the amounts of millions, if not, you know, hundreds of millions. So thank you for clarifying that. That's important for people to know. Um, anybody else? Go ahead, Rick. I think he's muted. Okay, yeah. there we go. Sorry, uh, I just so the, the ITIN number, it, the, the the money that they are that our community is putting paying into, is that part of that three billion dollars that we're hearing about that un, our undocumented community uh, is? Is that what that money is? Is that what that pot of three billion dollars is from? Is it from the ITIN contributions? Is it $3 billion or two point something billion dollars that un undocumented immigrants are contributing in taxes? Yes, so those taxes are folks who have ITIN, right? They're folks who are filing taxes with ITIN numbers, individual tax ID numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that much, it, it's that mm -hmm. much money in the state. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. In addition to all the other goods and services that they provide and contribute, right, to our society, like we discussed earlier, so. Um, okay, anybody else I see in the chat, um, let me just check a comment from Juan. Um, he just, uh, they also don't get the child tax credit. 
So uh, yeah, people who, who file their taxes using ITIN numbers are not eligible for the EITC um, you know, tax credit. Well, it's a tax credit. So um, thanks for sharing that one. Okay, anybody else? Any other comment? All right. Well, I want to thank every single one of you so much for being here today and spending your very um, precious time with us. I know that you're probably incredibly busy. Um, we're going to put this on our website and on social media for people to access at a later date. If they have further questions, I um, will we'll definitely do our best to help answer those. Um, thank you, Nancy, Jose, Aaron, and um, Reina, Megan. Juan, Rick, Claudia, Sandra for being here today. And, um, you know, we'll get through this, no doubt. But this is how we will, is by sharing information, by sticking together, and uh, really by creating those opportunities to access resources that are out there by connecting one another, right? And that's precisely the, the intent and the, the reason why uh, Mayor Dedina convened this task force is to ensure that nobody falls through the cracks and he was very uh, fast and proactive in establishing it. And, and for me, it's an honor to serve on the high risk population subcommittee because uh, you know, we wanna make sure that those most vulnerable in our community in Pearl Beach uh, you know, are connected to uh, resources that are desperately needed. Um, because as you know, we are predominantly a, a, work, a working community that is, um, you know, 50% Hispanic and, um, and a lot of folks uh, are really hurting right now. And so we really wanna thank all of you for being here today and, and helping them um, you know, uh, stay afloat, if at least so. Great, so thank thanks. you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Yes, thank Bye. you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Paloma, and thank you to the city of Imperial Beach. Mm -hmm.